All who are weak Come to the fountain Dip your heart in the stream of life Let the pain and the sorrow Be washed away In the waves of His mercy As deep cries out to deep we sing, come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. All who are thirsty, all who are weak, come to the fountain. Dip your heart in the stream of life Let the pain and the sorrow Be washed away In the waves of His mercy As deep cries out to deep We sing, come Lord Jesus, come Come, Lord Jesus, come. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. As deep cries out to deep, as deep cries out to deep, as deep cries out to deep, we sing, come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Holy Spirit, come. Father, one of the things that we love in this church is your presence. Father, we love that work of your Spirit upon our hearts. Lord, we love when the Spirit of truth massages our hearts and makes it ready for the Word of God to go deep in us, Lord, and to bear fruit. And so as we start our service this Wednesday night, Lord, we just pray that you would be here and we invite your presence into this place. What a remarkable thing when we study your word and we read that where two or three are gathered in your name, you're there. And that you inhabit the praises of your people. That's an amazing thing to me, Father, that you desire to be here with us. It's not amazing that we would desire to be here with you. But for you desire to be here with us, oh Lord, fill this place tonight. Speak to our hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name we ask, and all God's kids would say, Amen. Amen. Hey, let's remain standing. Lord, we have come to this house where we love to sing your praises. We Lift our hearts and our hands To the King of all the ages Hear us, Lord, we pray Come, Jesus, come Come fill this place Meet us here Meet us here, Lord We are few, but we are strong when you surround us Meet us here Meet us here, Lord As we gather in your name Meet us here Lord, we have come to this house 
Where we love to sing your praises We lift our hearts and our hands To the King of all the ages Hear us, Lord, we pray Come, Jesus, come Come fill this place Meet us here Meet us here, Lord We are few, but we are strong When you surround us Meet us here Meet us here, Lord As we gather in your name Meet us here Up. As we bow down, be lifted up, we lift you up, we lift you up, as we bow down, we lift you up. Let the heavens rejoice and the nations be glad As the whole earth tremble for you are God And we'll worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness Let the heavens rejoice and the nations be glad As the whole earth tremble for you are God And we'll worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness as we bow down, we lift you up. As we bow down, we lift you up. Be lifted up. Be lifted up. As we bow down. We lift it up, we lift you up, we lift you up, as we bow down, we lift you up. Let the heavens rejoice and the nations be glad, let the whole earth tremble for you are God, we'll worship the Lord. In the beauty of holiness Let the heavens rejoice And the nations be glad The whole earth tremble For you are God We'll worship the Lord In the beauty of holiness As we bow down We lift you up As we bow down we lift you up, we lift you up, we lift you up. Splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great! Is our God, sing with me how great Is our God, all will see how great How great 
is our God. H to H he stands, and time is in his hand, the beginning and the end, beginning and the end. The Godhead three in one, Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, the Lion and the Lamb. How great is our God, sing with me how great is our God, all will see how great, how great is our God. You're the name above all names, worthy of all praise. My heart will sing, how great is our God. You're the name above all names, worthy of all praise. My heart will sing, how great is our God. How great is our God, sing with me how great is our God, all will see how great, how great is our God. How great is our God, sing with me how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. Never change Overcome by all again Some things never change You are beauty unending You are glory descending Once again I stand in awe of you you are mercy unchanging, you are simply amazing, and once again I stand in awe of you. Here I am in awe again, some things never change. Overcome by all again Some things never change You are beauty unending You are glory descending Once again I stand in awe of you you are mercy unchanging, you are simply amazing, and once again I stand in awe of you. The secret in the quiet place in the stillness you are there 
In the secret, in the quiet hour I wait only for you Cause I want to know you more I want to know you I want to hear your voice I want to know you more I want to touch you I want to see your face I want to know you more I'm reaching for the highest goal That I might receive the prize Pressing onward, pushing every hindrance aside out of my way Cause I want to know you more I want to know you I want to see your face I want to know you more I want to touch you I want to see your face I want to know you more You'd stand for the last song. There's a peace I've come to know Though my heart and flesh may fail There's an anchor for my soul I can say it is well Jesus has overcome And the grave is overwhelmed The victory is won he is risen from the dead And I will rise When He calls my name No more sorrow, no more pain I will rise on eagle's wings Before my God Fall on my knees and rise I will rise there's a day that's drawing near When the darkness breaks to light And the shadows disappear And my faith shall be my heart Jesus has overcome And the grave is overwhelmed The victory is won he has risen from the dead And I will rise When He calls my name No more sorrow, no more pain I will rise on eagle's wings Before my God Fall on my knees and rise I will rise and I hear the voice of many angels sing Worthy is the Lamb And I hear the cry of every longing heart Worthy is the Lamb Worthy is the Lamb And I will rise when He calls my name no more sorrow, no more pain I will rise on the eagle's wings Before my God falls on my knees And rise, 
I'm anxious. I'm prepared. My heart longs for that moment. In a twinkling of an eye that this mortal is going to put on immortality, this corruption, incorruption, and I'm going to be whisked away, Lord, to meet you in the air. That's what you said. We're to comfort one another with those words, Lord. I'm excited. My father's house, man. I'm going to tell you that title runs around in my head. In my father's house. Wow. And so, Lord, we thank you for this blessed hope. We, we thank you, Lord, that, that there is a light, and it's a very bright one at the end of this tunnel. And so, Lord, we just thank you for that tonight. It just encourages us and it strengthens us just to keep putting one foot in front of another and keep moving forward. Lord, I want to pray for those of our fellowship tonight that are homesick and I certainly can pray with great compassion. I, it wasn't that many days ago that I was in that camp. And, and Lord, we just want to lift them before you. I certainly want to pray tonight for Susan Stubblefield and just those heart palpitations and, and whatever's going on, Lord, in her physical body, that you would heal her, that you would take care of that, Father. And then for every other physical, financial, emotional, spiritual need, Lord, you know what we have need of before we ask. And Lord, it's just a wonderful thing to be able to bring those things before you. And it's even more wonderful to be able to leave those things with you and not pick them up on the way out and just let you deal with them, Lord. And so we're going to do that tonight. We're just going to bring and cast all of our cares upon you because we know you care. That's a beautiful thing. You care for us. And so we do it in Jesus' name. And all God's kids would say, Amen. We'll spend a few moments greeting one another before you settle into your spot this evening. <clears throat> Okay, that's all the fellowship you get tonight. Find your spot. Can you remind them about the fundraiser Friday? Yeah. Six? Six o'clock. Okay. Six o'clock, tacos, and a movie. Hey, listen, don't forget this Friday night we have a fundraiser. Everybody look my direction so you know that I, I have eye contact and you are listening. This Friday night we have the fundraiser. It's tacos at 6 p.m. and a movie following for our uh, missions trip to Honduras. And then uh, those of you um, that sadly bid on the ammo and didn't get it, I will be collecting it on that day. So, <laughs> you know, we're going to have a fun evening. And just pray that I get the other projector fixed. We're all going to have to go over that way. Apparently the fan motor went out on one of our projectors, and so it cycles off the bulb, and that's what happened on Sunday. So just pray that the guy I'm going to take it to tomorrow can just get it fixed. Amen? Otherwise, those sitting over here, if we have a full house, we're going to have a hard time seeing the movie. So we want to make sure we get that fixed. So pray. Hey, let's turn our Bibles tonight. Genesis chapter 28. Can you believe it? The last time we were in Genesis, I did one verse. What is wrong? We, so tonight, we're gonna, we need to pick up the pace, or we're going to be in Genesis till Jesus comes. 
And we got other books that we need to be studying, and so we want to look at this. But hey, tonight, wonderful study as we finish the rest of all the other verses in Genesis 28. And so get your pad and pen out, turn to Genesis chapter 28, and let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Because we're not left to our own devices, and I thank you for that. I look at this crowd, and I look at me, and if you left us to our own devices to figure out on our own, we'd be a mess. We're a mess with your word, Lord. And so we thank you tonight that you've given us clear and concise instruction. We thank you that it's inerrant, it's inspired, and it's authoritative. It says what it means and means what it says. And so tonight, Lord as we look at three principles that we find in the rest of Genesis 28, Lord, may you speak to our hearts tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, let me ask you this. How many like the word obedience? Obedient, to obey, to come under the authority of. Well, you know, that's what we're going to find in the rest of chapter 28. It's a clear message of obedience. And there's three aspects to it. And so get your pad and pen out tonight and write this down. Number one, the blessing that comes with obedience. Now, we don't obey to get a blessing. We obey because it's in our heart to be pleasing to our Father. But notice that when we obey... There is a blessing that comes back to us for that obedience, and we're going to look at that tonight. Secondly, and I like this one, our obedience puts a desire in other people's hearts to obey. Your obedience will have an effect on people around you. As they see you obeying the Lord, as they see the blessings that come to you from that obedience, as they see that relationship and that intimacy continue, uh, kindled because of that obedience, it will put a desire, we'll see that tonight, and others as they're watching you to be obedient as well. And thirdly, obedience. How many want to court the presence of God? How many want that intimate relationship with Him? How many love it when you sit alone with your Bible open in prayer and you feel his presence and you, and you sense his touch? And, and man, you can just hear him speaking through the word to you and, and sometimes even beyond the word, not just in the logos, but in the rhema part of how he speaks. You know what? Obedience is the key, is the key to intimacy with God. It's the key, and we'll see that tonight. So we're going to dive into our study because I, I want to get through chapter 28 tonight. We'll just start back with verse 1. We already looked at it, but we'll get a run at starting back in verse 1. And Isaac called Jacob and blessed him, and he charged him. A charge is a commandment. It, it's, it's an, the Bible is written in military terms. It's an order. He says, I charged him, and I said unto him, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Now that's important. Because... When we read that little phrase, there's much behind the scenes that's being said. The Canaanites were vile and wicked people. In fact, if you read in Leviticus chapter 18, and you'll pick up about verse 20. In fact, the first part of chapter 18 talks about the sexual sin that we as believers are not to be involved in, that the Canaanites were involved in, And some of those things that are listed there are incestuous relationships, bestiality, homosexuality, adultery, every manner of fornication. In fact, they would have, in the Canaanite religious system, in their pantheon of gods, they would have priestesses that would come down from the temples and prostitute themselves to earn money uh, back to support those false temples. So very perverted sexually. And then when you look at Deuteronomy chapter 18, you find out that everything that we see today in the new age was being practiced back among the Canaanites. Necromancy, you know, trying to contact the dead. Spiritism, soothsayers, mind readers, fortune tellers. All of those things, as you read through there, you'll see, 
And God calls them witchcraft. He calls them abominations and abominable things. And all of those things were going on in Canaan. And so when we see here Isaac saying to Jacob, like Abraham also said to Eliezer when he got a bride for Isaac, don't go out among those of the Canaanites and get a bride. And the indication here is have nothing to do with the world. Now, we're hearing a lot today, and it's surprising to me. Even among Calvary chapels. In fact, I listened to a couple of the people who taught at the, at the uh, worship conference, the last one for Calvary Chapel down in Costa Mesa, and I was appalled. I was appalled at what was being said. Because one man stood before those young people. He's not a pastor. He's a worship leader. He shouldn't be teaching. But he said that what we should do is go out and be a part of the world. In fact, he said, I go to bars and I sing so I can interact. Listen, there are places as believers we have no business. Would you agree? There are things we have no business seeing. There are things we have no business hearing. There's places we have no business going. We're the blood-bought, spirit-filled bride of Christ. And he twisted the doctrine and the scriptures to say you can do these things. And I was thinking in my mind, well, what about 2 Corinthians chapter 6, starting in verse 13, where the Bible says, come out from among them and be ye separate. Touch not the unclean thing, and I'll be your father, and you'll be my sons and daughters, and I'll put my hand of blessing upon you. What about the second chapter of 1 John where it says, love not the world nor the things of the world, because if the love of the world be in you, the love of the Father is not. We are a separate people unto our God. And we don't have to participate with the sins of the world. We don't have to interact with the sins of the world to be a light to this world. We're going to see that tonight. We don't lower our standard to their level. We don't have to be culturally relevant. The gospel is above culture. It's above time and it's above geographic. Listen, it calls every man and every woman to a repentance and a holy walk with God. So thus, we see here in the scripture that Isaac says, listen, I am charging you, Jacob, when you get a wife, don't go get one among the Canaanites. Have nothing to do with it. Have nothing to do with the world, nor the things that are in the world. And so that's the commandment before us. Will he be obedient? That's the question. Because the commandment on us today, and if you agree with me, just say amen. You can say it loudly so it goes on the tape. The commandment with us today is to be a holy people unto our God, is it not? A separate people. Listen, I'm not going to go to a bar. I might stand outside of the bar when they come out and witness to them. I'm not going in. I'm to come out from among this world than I did 39 years ago and be separate. My God calls me not to touch unclean things. Not to be involved in these things. He tells us because the judgment of God is coming upon this world for who, those who practice such things. And God calls me to be obedient to his word. I don't need to understand it. I don't even need to necessarily like it. I just simply have to be obedient to it. Amen? Amen? Well, so he's telling his his son here, don't go and have any kind of relationship with or, or any kind of union with those of Cana. Arise, go to Padanaram, to the house of Bethuel, thy mother's father, and take thee a wife from thence of the daughters of Laban, thy mother's brother. And God Almighty will bless thee. See, if you're obedient, here's the deal. God Almighty will bless thee. He will make thee fruitful. He will multiply thee, that thou mayest be a multitude of people, and give thee the blessing of Abraham to thee, and to thy seed with thee, that thou mayest inherit the land. There's inheritance, not only a blessing, there's an inheritance. You know, the Bible makes it clear, all who practice such things have no inheritance in the kingdom of heaven. Do you believe that? Because there's a list of things it says there. Fornicators, adulterers, drug abusers, drunkards, liars, thieves. Paul, in his epistle, twice gives us a list of people. If that's your lifestyle, you're not going to heaven. 
because you haven't been obedient to the Word of God. Serious business, isn't it? Obedience is serious business. We don't take advantage of God's grace. We thank God every day that we're saved by grace because we could be saved no other way. Correct? We thank Him for that new birth that He gives us and that by faith, through grace, we are saved. We thank Him that He puts that Holy Spirit in us and gives us the desire to be obedient to the things He's called us to and then gives us the strength to do that. And when we do that, He blesses us. If you think you'll ever find a blessing in this world, if you ever think you're going to find a blessing being disobedient to God's command, you're foolish. You're foolish. And so the command was simple. Isaac tells Jacob, don't go and interact with the Canaanites. Don't find your wife there. It's a charge. It's a command. And if you're obedient, here's the deal. And God Almighty will bless thee. He will make thee fruitful. He will multiply thee. That thou mayest be a multitude of people. And he will give thee the blessing of Abraham. All of that covenant relationship that was with Abraham will be yours to thee. And thy seed with thee. That thou mayest inherit. There's an inheritance also, not just a blessing. And, and don't we have an inheritance with obedience as well? With Within thou art a stranger, and God gave to Abraham. So there's a blessing that comes. You know, I find it interesting. It just turned a few chapters over to Deuteronomy chapter 28. That's one of my favorite chapters in the Old Testament because, again, it speaks of obedience. And here's what it says. We'll just read chapter 20. I want to read the first 14 verses. And it shall come to pass. There's a promise in this. It will come to pass if, but it's conditional. God is saying, I'm going to give you a promise. It is conditional, but I want you to know if you will fulfill the conditions of this promise, you're going to get it. it, will, it there is a promise for you. And it shall come to pass if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe... And to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high and above all the nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon thee. In fact, they're going to overtake you. You're not going to be able to outrun them. It, like you would, but will overtake thee. And if thou shalt hearken, that means to listen with the intent to obey. If you will hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, Blessed thou shalt be in the city, and blessed thou shalt be in the field. Blessed thou shalt be in the fruit of thy body, and, and in the fruit of the ground. So your family is going to be blessed. Your occupation, what you do is going to be blessed. The fruit of your cattle, the increase of your, of your livestock, and of your flocks, and of your sheep. You shall be blessed in the basket of your storehouse. You're going to have plenty in an old age. In other words, that what you set aside for your old age, blessed shall thou be when you come in. You're going to be blessed when you go out. The Lord shall cause thine enemies to rise that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. They shall come in against thee one way and they shall flee seven. God will be your protection. The Lord shall command blessing upon thee in thy storehouse. He's going to, uh, and, and all that thou settest thy hand to do. He shall bless thee in the land which the Lord God giveth thee. And the Lord shall establish thee a holy people unto himself, as he has sworn unto thee, if thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God and walk in his ways. And all the people of earth shall see that thou art called by the name of the Lord, and that they shall be afraid of thee. And the Lord shall make thee plenteous in goods and in fruit of the body and in the fruit of the cattle and in the fruit of the ground. And, 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 and the Lord will swear unto thy fathers to give these things to you. The Lord shall open unto the, you a good treasure. The heaven shall give rain, thank God for that today, unto thy lands in his season, and to bless all the work of thy hand. Thou shalt lend unto the nations and not borrow. Thou, uh, and the Lord thy God shall make thee the head and not the tail. I like that. And above everything else, listen, it, it, 
that everything's going to, you're going to be above everything and everything else is going to be beneath you. If thou wilt hearken, listen to obey unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day to observe and to do them. And thou shalt not go aside from any of the words which I command thee this day to the right or to the left to go after other gods to serve them. So we see that in obedience, and we're going to see that as we go through Genesis, in obedience, which we're going to see Jacob will be under the commandment of his father, as he obeys those commandments, he will receive and is going to receive as we get into other chapters, a blessing. You see, God wants to bless you. I know I'm not one of those name it, claim it, blab it, grab it kind of guys, but I do know that the scripture says that God wants to bless his sons and his daughters. And he gives you a promise. And the promise is simply this. If you will hearken unto the voice of your God, if you will keep his statutes and obey his commandments and walk in his ways, if you will hearken unto his voice, if you'll simply be obedient, then he will lead you into a blessing. And when you study that out and you break that down, the first 14 verses there of Deuteronomy 28, every aspect of your life, your family, your marriage, your source of income, the place you live. In fact, he puts a capstone on it by saying everything your hand touches will be blessed of the Lord. He will protect you. And all he's saying is the condition is simple obedience. If you will obey. And so we see there in in chapter 28 that that's exactly what Jacob did when he was commanded not to do those things and he was told that a blessing would come if he would be obedient. Watch what it says in verse 5. And Isaac sent away Jacob and he went to Padadanaram unto Laban, the son of Bethuel, the Syrian, the brother of Rebekah, Jacob, and Esau's mother. And Esau saw, here's the second thing I want you to say, see. Um, and Esau, now it, you'll remember that Esau did marry. If you go back to the end of chapter 27, let's just look there for a moment in verse 46. Rebekah said to Isaac, I'm very weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. If Jacob take a wife of the daughters of Heth, such as these which are, are the daughters of the land, what good is my life? Why? Because Esau had married some of the Canaanite daughters. Esau, his brother, was disobedient. And here we see Esau watching Isaac give instruction to Jacob. No doubt seeing the heart of Jacob to be obedient to those things. Leaving his father's house and going in the direction his father commanded him. No doubt to receive a wife, to be obedient, to obey. And it says there, when Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob, and send him away to Padadanaram to take a wife from thence, and that as he blessed him, he gave him a charge, saying, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan, and that Jacob obeyed his father and his mother, and was gone to Padadanaram, that Esau, seeing that the daughters of Canaan pleased not Isaac his father, Then went Esau to Ishmael, and he took himself wives, other wives, not of the wives of the Canaanites, but wives of his family and of his lineage. The second point I want to make to you is that, listen, people are watching you. In fact, I believe personally, when we do evangelism, that your life is speaking so loud, people have a hard time hearing your words. And don't think people aren't watching you because the Bible says you are epistles read of every man. People are watching you. You have neighbors and you have unsaved loved ones and unsaved family members and they're watching you because you've named the name of Christ. 
You said that Jesus Christ is your Lord and your Savior. You have proclaimed to them that you've been born again and you're a new creature in Christ Jesus, that old things have passed away and all things have become brand new. And no doubt, many of you have shared the gospel message with those people in your family and of your friends and the people you interact with at work that don't know the Lord and maybe they haven't come to Christ yet, but they're watching you. And they're drawing their conclusions of the God that you serve by what they see in you because you're the only Bible they're able to read at this moment. Now Esau would be a type, if we're looking at types and shadows here, of a man who wasn't obedient to the things of the Lord. A man who was worldly and involved in worldly things, married into those Canaanite wives, and no doubt brought those practices and those religions into his life, and it grieved his parents. But as Esau watches as he observes, as he listens, and as he sees that here his brother Jacob being blessed by his father and mother because of his obedience and obeying the instructions of his father. And no doubt later we'll see the blessing that comes from that. It sparked a desire in him to be obedient as well. Now, to prove this point, I want you to turn with me to Matthew chapter Five, interesting passage, Jesus speaking. Jesus says this in verse 13 of Matthew chapter 5. He makes some statements. These are, these, these are uh, well, they can be imperatives, but they're certainly statements to us. He's telling us what we as Christians are to be like as we interact with this world. You see, first of all, in our own personal life, in order to be blessed of the Lord, we need to be obedient. To obey is better than sacrifice, to hearken more than the fat of rams. What God desires, what God requires of us is obedience. That's why Jesus says in the New Testament, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things that I say? Obedience is not an option. It's a requirement. Now, he's given us a safety net called grace, doing our best to be obedient when we come short, and we always will, we always do, don't we? And we fall, grace catches us. God's grace is sufficient. But we don't presume upon that grace and just go ahead and be disobedient. No, our heart is to be obedient. It is the passion, it is our desire to be obedient. And we find that when we are obedient, then God just begins to pour out his blessings upon us. We're blessed in every aspect of our life because what we've done is put ourselves in a position where our Father can bless us. Isn't that what he said again as we're quoting 2 Corinthians chapter 6 there in verse uh, 13 and on it says, come out from among them and be separate. Touch not the unclean thing. You'll be my sons and daughters, says the Almighty. The word Almighty is only used there and several other times in, in the New Testament in Revelation and it means to put my hand a blessing upon you. Provision and protection. And so as we are obedient, certainly blessings come to us, and we thank God for those. That's not the reason why we're obedient. We're obedient because we love our Heavenly Father. We love Him, and His His commandments aren't burdensome to us. We want to follow Him. We're so grateful for His redemption and for His salvation. We understand the pit that He drug us out of. We understand what He's done for us. You know, we marvel at his grace and in, and in response to all that he's done for us, we want to be obedient. And, and, and in that, here comes the blessing. And now as others are watching, you being blessed. It stirs something in them. And here's what Jesus said it would stir. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. Now, When you go home, here's an experiment you can do. You go home and you take a salt shaker, take the lid off. Just pour as much as you can into your mouth. And when you get done spitting up and maybe even throwing up, the very next thing that's going to happen in your life is you're going to be very thirsty. Salt has 
the characteristic built in it to create thirst. One of the aspects of the Christian life is that we create thirst and other people to have what we have. Salt also has an antiseptic effect in that it stops putrefaction, but it creates thirst. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its savor, I love what in the Greek the word savor means. It really means to go insane if you've lost your mind, <laughs> if you've lost your ability to create thirst in the people. Where shall it be salted? It therefore is is of no use. It's, it's good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the feet of men. So what it's saying is if, if you're called to create a thirst in somebody else because they see the blessing of your obedience to the Lord, but you're not being obedient and you're not being blessed and they're looking at you and they're saying that you're no different than the world, then it's not going to create a thirst in God for them to come and know Him and walk with Him. You follow? And then Jesus goes on to say in verse 14, you're the light of the world. You know, light attracts. Did you know that? In fact, I just recently read, because we were out in the desert camping, and we were camping in such a spot, we were up on this hill, and when you came around the road, the only road leading into where we were camping out in the desert, out beyond Lovelock, it was 10 miles when you finally rounded the mountain across this valley, up the other side where we were camping. Ten miles. And we had a campfire there, and as we were camping, we looked way across, and we saw these lights, these headlights, and, and we kept seeing them coming closer and closer and closer and closer, and it took quite a while, and coming down this dirt road, and the next thing, you know, the guy pulls up into our camp. And I said, can we help you? And he says, man, I just saw your campfire, and it just was so appealing. I wanted to come up and see who was camping here. I got some friends camping down the road, but I just came up to see what was going on in your camp. You see, light attracts people. You know, it's been said, and I think it to be true, that you can see a candle with the naked eye on extremely dark night 10 miles away. You are the light of the world. And a city that is set upon a hill cannot be hid. It can't. Neither doth men light a candle and put them under a bushel or under a basket, but they put it on a candlestick and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. And then he says this in verse 16. Let your light so shine before men. Get this. That they may see your good works, your obedience. And glorify your Father which is in heaven. What is Jesus saying? You're the salt of the earth. You create a thirst in other people to serve the Lord. You're the light of the world. There's something attractive about you. There's something that they want to see. There's something that draws them to you. And when they're witnessing you and watching you and they're watching your obedience and your good works and how you live out your life in obedience to the Father, it says there, when they see your good works, what's going to happen? It's going to put a desire in them to be obedient as well. That's what it's saying here. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So obedience doesn't just bring a blessing. It doesn't just put you in a place or a position that God can bless you in every aspect of your life because the Lord wants to bless his kids. You can be saved and live very low or you can live very high in your Christian walk. You can be saved today by grace and living in such a way that God can't bless you. Or you can be saved tonight by grace and living in such a way that you put yourself in a position that God can bless you because he desires to bless you. That's why there's a condition when he writes to his people in Deuteronomy 28. And that's one of those general blessings to God's people. If, it shall come to pass, if you will do these things, then I will bless you. And when you're walking in that blessed life and the joy of the Lord is your strength and at his right hand are pleasures evermore and you've got to bounce in your step and man, you've got a confidence in your life and you're just blessed beyond. You're blessed out of your skull, man. You're blessed out of your socks. People see it. And they go, man, what's wrong with you? Nothing wrong with me. Well, dude, man, don't you understand the economy? Yeah, but I'm blessed. Well, dude, don't you understand this 
H1N1 virus is going around. Yeah, but I'm blessed. And they might say, well, you know, my marriage is on the rocks. Mine ain't. Why? I'm obedient to what God commanded me. I'm blessed. Well, man, didn't you realize what Obama did? Man, he ripped us off and our 401ks and, and all of the, what we had. I'm blessed. I don't care. My father's going to provide all my needs according to his riches in heavenly places. You know, Obama and that administration doesn't affect what God does. I'm blessed. And when they see you being blessed as a child of God because of your obedience, they're going to say, how do I get some of that? It'll put a hunger and a desire for them to also come and be obedient. That's what the word says. And the last thing that we see as we read on, let's read on back to, to the ranch. Genesis chapter 28. So he saw, saw all these things, these blessings. And then it says this in verse 10. We pick up the story in verse 10 again. And Jacob went out from Beersheba, and he went toward Haran. He's being obedient to his father. He's doing exactly what he was commanded and charged to do. Because of his obedience, a blessing came upon him. He's blessed. You know, Isaac pronounced that blessing upon him. Because he's obedient, and his brother, who's not obedient, sees the blessing on him. There's a desire in his heart now to be obedient as well, that he might be put back in a place of blessing. And then we read here in verse 10, And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran, and he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night, because the sun was set, and he took a stone, some stones, that were found there in that place, and he put them for his pillow, and he laid down in the place, and he went to sleep. Man, that's a rough night. How many of you ever been out backpacking, and all you got's a rock for a pillow? That's a rough night. But notice that he has the sleep of the righteous because he's obedient. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. David said when he was in sin, and his sin was unconfessed before the Father, that he was like a hinge on his bed day and night, rocking back and forth. He had no rest. He said his life was like a, a, a summer leaf that had dried up. You can go back and read through the, that period of, uh, in the Psalms of David's life when he was unrepentant and he was trying to hide his sin and run from God. He says, man, I, I was dried up inside. He said, there was no rest for me. He said, man, I was like a man that was on a hinge all night long, rocking back and forth in my bed. I couldn't get any rest. He said, but when I repented... When I confessed my sin and God forgave me, there was a peace and a rest that came. Listen, if you're right with God, you can go to sleep on a rock for a pillow. And it won't be a problem. And then watch verse 12. And he dreamed. He thinks it's a dream. Maybe it's a dream. Maybe it's reality. We don't know. But he dreamed. And behold, a ladder set up on the earth. And the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, angels of God were ascending and descending upon this ladder. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac, and the land wherein thou liest, the place you're sleeping right now, to thee will I give thee and thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth. And thou shalt spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. No doubt speaking of the Messiah. And behold, here it is. I am with thee. What does obedience bring? Intimacy. I'm with you, Jacob. You, because your obedience, will get to experience my presence. I'm with you. And imagine what he's seeing is pretty remarkable as well. I will be with thee. Get this. I will keep thee. I'm going to guard you. I'm going to protect you. And all the places where thou goest. And I will bring thee again unto this land. Now, your people are going to journey out. We know as we read through Genesis, they're going to find themselves in Egypt. And when they leave Egypt and they come back, 
into the promised land. They're going to be instructed to wipe out all the Canaanites and to possess that land that God's going to give them, a land flowing with milk and honey. God's promise is, I'm going to bring you back into this land. And Jacob awoke out of his sleep, and he said, and I want you to hear these words carefully, surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. You see, he did not know God's presence in his life until he was obedient. When he was being true to his name, dirty, rotten thief, manipulator. When he was deceiving his brother out of his birthright and out of his blessing and doing all of that stuff he shouldn't be doing, he did not know the presence of God. But the minute that Jacob became obedient, The minute Jacob set his heart to be obedient to what his father had instructed him to have nothing to do with the Canaanites or the world but to seek a wife among godly people. As Jacob was obedient, not only was Jacob blessed for his obedience, it created a thirst in his brother's heart to be obedient, and it brought the presence of the living God in a real way in his life. In a very special way, a very intimate way, and that he sees this ladder and these angels ascending and descending. There's like, all of a sudden now I'm connected with the heavenlies. It's not just I'm having an earthly relationship. I'm connected with the heavenlies and I'm seeing these things and I'm seeing the Lord and he's speaking to me and he's saying, listen, Jacob, I'll be with you wherever you go. I'll protect you. No harm will come to you. Everything I promise eventually is going to come to pass in your life. And when he awoke, he said, wow, surely the Lord was in his place, and I didn't know it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? Well, guess what? He's forgetting already. It's not the place. Because when he leaves, is he's going to call this thing Bethel, the house of God. When he leaves, God said, wherever you go, I'm going with you. Listen, God's not in this building. In fact, I want you to know, this isn't the church. You're the church. It's just an old building we bought. Uh, More accurately, this would be a sheep barn where we can get in out of the weather. You're the church. You bring God with you when you come, and guess what? He goes with you when you leave. Now, he's still here during the week because I'm here. But he's with you. The Bible says that the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayers. Jesus said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. The Bible says he's an ever-present help in a time of need. He's close to those who are close to him. In fact, James says, draw near unto God and he will draw near unto you. How do you draw near? He says, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and wash your hearts, you who transgress against his law. Become obedient. Let your laughter be turned to mourning. Be humble before the Lord and he will lift you up. Where will he lift you up? Into his very presence. And so the three things that we're seeing taught here is this. Number one, be obedient because it brings the blessing. Secondly, be obedient because it creates a thirst in others to know the living God that you know. And thirdly, obedience will bring the presence of the living God in your life in a very real way. I have people say, well, you know, serving the Lord is boring. Then you don't know the God that I know. Or really, I hear you talk about prayer and God speaking to you in the presence of God. I don't ever feel any of that stuff. Well, okay, let's take a look at your life. What are you doing? What are you involved in you shouldn't be involved in? I will tell you tonight that Jacob woke up after being obedient and says, Wow, God is in this place. And I didn't know it. This is a wonderful, this is an awesome thing. What to do, what to do. So he starts stacking up rocks. He's going to build an altar. 
But he doesn't understand that when he leaves that place called Bethel, God still goes with him. Watch this. And so he, he says that this is none other than the house of God. This is the gate to heaven. No, the gate to heaven is here. You take it with you. You're the gatekeeper. And so, and Jacob rose up early in the morning and he took some stones. I mean, I mean, I understand what he's trying to do here. That he had put up for a pillow and he set up a pillar and he poured oil on top of it and he called the name of the place Bethel. That means the house of God. But the name of the city was called Luz at first. And Jacob vowed a vow saying. And you know, and, and I love this because again, he is promising the Lord that if you will help me, here's the deal. Because here's the struggle we have with obedience. The minute I say, you need to be obedient. Or I say, listen, you need to make Jesus Christ your Lord. You need to do the things he says. The first thing you think in your mind is, but I'm such a mess. I don't know if I can do that. That's difficult. That's hard. What if I fail? Let me let you in on a little key. The only thing you bring to the table is a willing heart. The strength to be obedient, God will give you. But he'll only give it to you if you bring to him a willing heart. I start out every morning praying this prayer, Lord, help me to be obedient. You see, it is my heart to be obedient. I want to obey. I don't want to be disobedient. I want to hearken unto your voice. I want to listen to what you have to say in my time of devotion in your word. If you've got something to say beyond that, I want to listen. And Lord, I listen with the intent to be obedient, but what I will tell you straight up, Lord, unless you help me, it doesn't matter what good intentions I bring to the table. I'm not going to be able to do that if you don't give me the strength because I only have a little strength. I'm weak. The spirit is willing, but this flesh, it's weak. And Lord, I need that power of your Holy Spirit. I need that fresh baptism today because what you gave me yesterday, I've already used it up. I'm leaky and I leak and I need some more of that today. And what I find, what I know, what I've experienced, what I've studied and understand doctrinally in the Bible is this. I bring to God a willing heart. And he gives me power and strength to do what is in my heart to do. He's the source of the strength, not me. God's not asking you to do this in your own strength. He knows you can't. He, you know, in the Psalms, he says, I know your friend, I know you're but dust. He tells us in Revelation, I know that you have a little strength. But we can tap in if we are willing to the source of all strength. You might say to me today, well, you know, man, I've struggled all my life with pornography. You don't have to. Well, how can you say that? I got testosterone flowing through me, man. And you don't understand. Why. I don't need to know any of that stuff. I just simply need to know this. The Bible says it's wrong. And if you have a willing heart to be obedient and you bring that problem to the Lord and you ask him for strength, he will give it to you. Because Peter said, all things that pertain to life and godliness have been given to you in Christ Jesus. Everything you need. You might be struggling with alcohol or illicit illegal drugs, or prescription drugs, any mind-altering drug. The Bible calls it witchcraft. It's pharmica. And you might be struggling with that, and you might be saying, but you don't understand my situation. I don't need to. But I just can't stop. I've tried. I get that. I understand. You're right. You can't. But the Bible never asked you to do it. What the Bible asks of you, if you will bring a willing heart to be obedient, he will meet you there. Draw near to God, James says, and he will draw near to you. Come with repentance and brokenness and humility and he will lift you up. I find it amazing because no temptation has taken you such as taken me. You know, some of you guys think I'm bulletproof as a pastor. I've had people say, but you don't understand. Oh, really? I got this testosterone and I got a, I'm a man too, dude. I'm old, I'm not dead. But I know this, I'm not going to dishonor my Lord with my thought life. I'm not going to do it. It's 
not in my heart to do it. Satan, you're not going to make me do it. And so I go to my father and I say, Lord, I'm weak, but you're strong. I don't want to sin against you. Hey, I'll let you in a little clue. There's times I get done counseling with some of you that I want to stop by a liquor store on the way home and get the biggest bottle of Jack Daniels I can. Man, I'm going to tell you because, man, I, I, oh, my God, you know, just, oh, I, you know, I, I have joy, but man, I have to, not just you guys, people like, and I, but I said, you know, Lord, that, the, the peace is not found in a bottle, it's found in you. I don't need that. It's not found in a pill. Listen carefully, the key to obedience. Now, we've seen in the life of Jacob in Genesis 28, that first of all, God said, through, as this principle is laid out, through Isaac, son, do this. Don't interact with the world, but go here to interact. And he's obedient. And as soon as he begins to move in obedience, the blessings come. We just read that, correct? And as he moves in blessing, and his brother who's not walking as he is, sees him, sees the blessing, sees how it pleases the father that he is obedient, then what does he do? It stirs in his heart to be obedient too. Obedience is contagious. And thirdly, it puts Jacob in a place that he's never been before, a place where he has intimacy with the Lord. Hey, God's in this place and I didn't know it. You will have an intimate relationship with the Lord that you have never known before when you bring a willing heart to be obedient to the Father. And by the way, again, I want to close out with this. This is all that you bring. God knows you're weak. He knows that you're at war of the spirit against the flesh. He knows your frame and he knows you're but dust. He knows you have a little strength. He knows that you have a tempter that's relentless. But this is what Jacob says. I love it as he makes this altar before the Lord. He says this, and I want you to listen carefully to what Jacob says. And Jacob vowed a vow saying, if, if God will be with me. God, if you will strengthen me, and Lord, if you will keep me in this way that I go, if you will guard me and keep me and help me and protect me, and Lord, if you will give me bread, the bread of life, the word of God, I like that, to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my Father's house in peace. If, Lord, if what I'm going to commit to you, you're able to keep, you're able to guard. If you'll do that, and you'll bring me again to my Father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. He says, that's all he's asking you to bring. He says, come bring a willing heart. Come and bring a desire to be obedient. Stop making excuses for your sin and just come and confess it and say, Lord, I'm weak, but I want to be pleasing. It's my heart to be obedient. The spirit is willing, Lord, but this flesh, man, it's it's weak. But Lord, this is the vow that I'll make to you. If God, you will be with me. Lord, if you will guide me and guard me and protect me and keep me in the way that I go. And if you will give me bread to eat and raiment to put upon so that I come again to my Father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house and all that thou shalt give me I will surely give thee a tenth back to show you my appreciation if you'll do this for me. All that you give me, I'll give a tenth of it back. And if you watch Jacob's life, when he makes that vow, as we go through Genesis, things begin to transpire and there's going to come a moment and there's going to come a day when Jacob is going to wrestle with the Lord and God's going to give him a new name. Do you know you have a new name? God's given you a new name. I'm so glad when I get to heaven I get a new name. Aren't you? 
because there's some reputation and some rap associated with this name that I don't want going on on the other side, right? Oh, Mike Warren. Are you the Mike Warren? I don't know the guy. That guy's dead. That part of him stayed there. That was the earth suit. I'm the new guy. No, my, my name is Ralph. It ain't, you know, we get a new name. And I'm glad for that. But here's what he's saying, that Lord, listen, if you'll do this, and Jacob got a new name. He wrestled with the Lord. He walked with a limb. And his name was changed from dirty, rotten thief to Israel, which means ruled by God. God can do it. You can't. Here's what Jesus said. Without me, you can do... What is it? Say it really loud. Because some of you act like I can do some things or most things. But what can you do without his help? What? I'm hard of hearing tonight. What? Yeah, you're just in the same camp I am. But Jesus also said, you can do what? Some things? Most things? All things. Through Christ, what? What's he do? Strengthens you. How many want to be blessed? How many want your life to be such a blessing out of people's lives they desire to give glory to the Heavenly Father because they see how you're living? How many want to have intimacy with the Father where you go, wow, God is in this place? Obedience is required. And the question is tonight, well, how? 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 It's very simple. You bring a willing heart. How many are willing to be obedient? I'm not saying that you can be obedient in your strength. How many are willing? How many are willing to let go of those things you know are against God's commandments for you? How many are willing to let go of those things and say, I don't want any more to do. I want, I, want to, I want to walk with the Lord. See, that's all you need to bring. That's all you need to bring. Because God will give you the strength to be obedient. Because you can do all things through Christ. You can be obedient. Now, do I got to be obedient all the time? No, you're not going to. You're still going to struggle and you're going to fall. You know, my son just went through the part of boot camp and he was very concerned. He wanted us to pray about this because there's three rankings. Uh, it's... Uh, if I get this right, marksman, sharpshooter, and then expert. An expert, I mean, and you, when you see what they got to shoot at 200 yards, 300 yards, 500 yards, shoot on the move, lay down, run, stand up. And I mean, it's a whole gyration they go through. And he said, Dad, I want to be an expert. I said, okay, I'll pray. An expert is 37 out of 40. You see, you, you can be, and because I think God, you can be an expert. You don't have to get it right all the time, but get it right most of the time. And those times you don't get it right, what do you do? You repent. And you get back up. And you forget what's behind you and you press forward. Paul said, after 30 years of serving the Lord, as he wrote to the church at Philippi, and I will close with this. He said, I have not apprehended completely that which I've been apprehended for, nor am I already perfect. I've not attained to that which God has called me to attain, but this one thing I do, I forget those things that are behind me. How can he do that? Through repentance. And I press forward to the upward calling of Christ Jesus, my Lord. Paul said there were many times he was knocked down, but he was never knocked out. Pressed hard, but never discouraged to the point that he didn't keep moving forward. I challenge you tonight 
that God's requirement, and never lower it, is obedience. God's requirement is holiness. God's requirement is separation from the world. Come out from among and be separate. Don't listen to this other stuff that's being touted today. God wants to bless his kids and he wants you to be a witness and a blessing to those who are disobedient so they'll come to the faith. He wants to use you in that way. And he wants you to know his presence and he knows all of that is tied to obedience. And he wants you to know that the only thing you need to bring to the table to be obedient is a willing heart. And God will do the rest. Because Christ will strengthen you. Now, there's some effort in that. Don't think there is not. Because when the devil is tempting you, you have to say, I'm not doing that. And I'm going to go now and pray that my father will give me the strength not to listen to what you're saying, Satan. I'm going to resist you. And you've got to flee. That's what James says. Resist him and he has to flee. But you have to resist him. And the way you resist him is because you have a heart that doesn't want to sin. You have a heart that wants to be obedient, so you resist. You resist him steadfast. And he will go away, I promise you. I'm not saying he won't come back, but he will go away. And you will be able to stand. Having done all to stand, stand. Amen? So listen, we want to be obedient. How many wants to be obedient? How many know that all the thing you bring to this thing called obedience is a willing heart? Are you willing? Then God will make it possible. God will make it possible. His arm is not short. I don't care what your particular struggle is, God will give you victory. Because the Bible says sin shall not have dominion over you. Do you believe that? I believe it. Because I want the blessed life. I don't want to be, how many want to be a Jacob? It's a loaded question. How many wants to be an Israel? Yeah, let's stand. I used up the time, so I'll close you in a song. But let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And, you know, just for me, the Old Testament is so exciting because there's so many principles in it. It's not just to be studied as a narrative. In fact, Paul tells us that. He said the things written in the Old Testament are written for our learning and for our understanding, those of us that have come to the end of the age, there are principles in the Old Testament. And I love chapter 28 because there are those principles of obedience found in it. And we thank you tonight that you dug those things out for us and you, and you made them real to us, Lord. And so what we want you to know tonight, Father, is, you know, it is our heart to be obedient. Not because of the blessings that are associated with obedience. It's just because we want to be obedient and we thank you for the blessings that follow. We thank you that as we live a life of salt and light, it does create a thirst and it does draw people to us and ultimately to you, Father. As they see our good works, they will come to glorify you. And then, Lord, we thank you for your presence. You know, Lord, the thing that I court more of you today than I ever have in my life is your presence. I love your presence, Lord. I love to get up early in the morning. I love just to have that quiet time. I thank you that my wife and I are at a time in our lives where we can sit quietly in the morning and she's praying and studying, I'm praying and studying, and just, you know, just without any interruptions whatsoever, just wait on you. And hear your voice. And be in awe. Because God's in this place. Oh, I thank you, Father. I thank you that I serve the living God. The God that wants to have intimate fellowship with his sons and daughters. That God that loves me more than I could ever comprehend. A God that went to extreme lengths to bring me back into fellowship with Him. 
and has given me the wonderful gift of the Holy Spirit and this great thing called prayer and this amazing thing called the Word of God for me to enjoy as I'm in His presence. So thank you for all these things tonight, Lord. And again, Lord, you want us to be obedient. We want to be obedient. Give us the strength to be obedient, we pray. In the mighty name of Jesus. And all God's kids would say, I love you, Lord. And I lift my voice to worship you, O my soul, rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you hear, let it be a sweet, a very sweet sound in your ear. Father, we love you. And Lord, you have given us a new heart. And written on that heart is the word of God. You've made it possible by the garment that you purchased for us for us to stand in your presence. In fact, Lord, you say to us, come boldly into the very throne room that you might be able to receive help and mercy in a time of need. We thank you for all of these things, Father. But most of all, we thank you for this wonderful relationship we have with you. And the heart that you've given us to love you, to desire obedience toward you. Lord, you know, your word says that, that they that are yours, your sheep, love your word and that your commandments aren't burdensome. They're not. They're not. The frustration I have is not with what you've asked me to do. It's with my inability to do it. That's my frustration. But I thank you, Father, that all things that pertain to life and godliness you have given to me in Christ Jesus. Help me to appropriate those things. Help me to put into practice that strength and that power you've given me <clears throat> to resist the wicked one. And having done all to stand, just to stand. I want to be obedient, Lord. Help us to be that we pray. In the mighty name of Jesus we ask. And all God's sons and daughters would say, Amen. 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 Hey, if you need prayer, we'll be right up here. Can we get help with the chairs? Just put back out on the side. Don't slide them. You have to pick them up.